So I asked the question in this lecture if uh, ditches and the digital have uh, morality and the an answer to this uh, rather rhetorical question is uh, yes, but only to some extent though. And that after the but sort of uh, reflects the way that I ontologically embrace uh, the world and reality through uh, technological lenses. And I return to that. Uh, let me tell you a little bit uh, about myself. Uh, I have originally a Master of Arts in specializing in architecture, in art, history, and that's a fairly old uh, master from the 80s. And then I did a lot of things, other things in the 90s uh, and in the beginning of um, the millennium, but have been in this sort of academia for the past 20 years. I wrote my PhD back in, I finished it back in 2007. And it was about a humanist moving around in the hospital, looking at uh, how uh, users appropriated electronic health records. And uh, I did some cultural analysis uh, upon that. And it was uh, rather interesting work for myself, at least. Today, I'm an associate professor at the Department of Planning at the Aalborg University. And as Olga was saying, I'm a program coordinator, leader of, um, of techno anthropology, which is a study program that has existed for the past 10, 11 years, both in Aalborg and here in uh, Copenhagen. I also was a co founder of. Uh, the program of art and uh, technology at this uh, university. I haven't written this on the slide, but uh, perhaps interesting for you, I've been teaching and doing research uh, within the program of architecture and design and media technology at uh, Aalborg University as well. And quite a lot of my publications still revolve around uh, architecture and the list that I finished my uh, my talk here today with will show how this is still the case. There's a new publication coming out just now here in February on uh, post phenomenology and architecture and about human technology world relations in the built environment. So I'm still I'm still in that in that uh, area. So my research is about philosophy of technology. That's the main reason why I'm sitting here today. Uh, I do research still into e-health uh, in the healthcare system. And uh, of course, as I was saying, architecture and uh, design. Okay, let me tell you a little about the contents for the coming hour. I'll do some uh, introductory remarks upon politics, upon morals and ethics. Uh, I'll tell you shortly, very shortly about my theoretical background. I have already lifted some wheels uh, upon that matter. I'll introduce you to a concept that I've been working on for the past five years, uh, scaffolding, and uh, which should make some sort of sense to the audience today. Uh, of course, using it in, in, a, in a metaphorical and perhaps more abstract way than the, the actual physical scaffolding or building of scaffolds in the f real physical world out there. But nevertheless, there are some ties to how we physically build scaffolds and how we metaphorically deal with scaffolds as I've set up a sort of framework for, for all of this. Then something about uh, life in the digital, a question concerning numbers and measures, because that's where we are when we deal with uh, digits, zeros and ones and construct realities uh, from that numerical outset. Then I have another concept that I'm working with currently, which is about uh, techno activism and I will show you some models upon that and then finally perhaps some concluding remarks. So I've got a lot to do 
for the coming hours and let's see i hope there will be some space for questions and uh, answers but if not we can continue that later today in the session uh, after noon so you all know that figure on i guess it must be your left hand side of uh, the screen the un sustainable development goals that is uh, all over the place it's pervading all <laughs> the academic world at, at least for how to to deal with uh, our knowledge uh, production and uh, the products that come out in the very end of what we do as uh, both within humanities or social sciences but specifically and perhaps even foremost within the um, natural and technical sciences we strive towards uh, fulfilling these goals and there's uh, been set a, a sort of deadline also temporal deadline for uh, most of these goals that should be seen on a systemic uh, level on a holistic level they are tied together and they should be considered at, as that and not just picked in at okay now we deal with water or now we do deal with education or now we deal with whatever is part of of the rainbow <coughs> figure a circular rainbow uh, rainbow figure but as i read it and as uh, it perhaps even ought to be read it's 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 all about having a mission uh, for your work and doing and be driven by a set of values the moment that you technolo technological innovate and one of my uh, so to say gurus within uh, philosophy of technology the american uh, philosopher andrew feenberg uh, moves around in, in conferences he's never written it actually but always uh, says and uh, and when he do his uh, talks, does his talks, he's, he's all about uh, values of today are the facts of tomorrow. So it's very, very important that we have our values explicit and that we discuss our values and that we frame our values today because those will in the end become the facts of uh, tomorrow. And engineers and designers are these transformers and translators of values that eventually will become those uh, facts so your role in this setup is extremely important and it's extremely important that you get the grips of those values that are up and going for uh, right now and also partake as i see it in the debates and the discussions <coughs> on a <clears throat> regular basis i took out the next quote uh, from another figure that i've been inspired quite a lot about uh, by is the french philosopher jacques ellul and he's uh, dead and gone uh, for very long now but he is allegedly said back in the 60s that uh, we ought to think global when we act uh, on a local level and that still makes so much sense today and uh, i think also think that these goals can only be reached by and with technology technology is part of uh, the game independently of what kind of technology we are talking about but digital technologies in their per pervasiveness is a very very strong if not the strongest player at all in this picture upon how technology is uh, constantly moving touching and shaping things and as i see it what is needed is a techno activism i'll return to that at the end of uh, of the story today setting up the question of uh, do digits have morality of um, of course inspired by uh, langdon winner and um, another uh, american philosophy philosopher that back in the 80s asked if uh, artifacts have politics artifacts just another way of 
addressing uh, technologies and he also uh, tried to answer this uh, question he removed the question mark though which means no longer a question um, by uh, showing or pointing at a case it happened back in the 20s i guess yeah 1920s with robert moses an urban planner and designer that mainly performed in in new york back then and allegedly built very low bridges that prevented uh, public transportation for reaching the beaches of uh, long island and you have a quote up on the left hand side of uh, the slide that tells you how poor people poor and black people that normally use public transit transit were kept off the roads because the 12 foot tall buses couldn't get through the overpasses one consequence was to limit the access to Jones Beach, Moses' widely acclaimed public park that he also built out there. So this artifact did have political and, as I see it as well, eth ethical elements built in into it by the actual designer. And of course, uh, it was Moses that designed these bridges. It was uh, decision makers in New York uh, City, municipality that decided these uh, low hanging bridges should, should be built. But over time, they sort of say overtaken a certain kind of role and meaning on their own, detached from the original designers. The fact is though, that uh, later research in in the 90s showed that there were bus plans reaching that showed that buses actually reached jones beach on long island they just took other roads but the most direct one was this one uh, buses were prevented from from moving upon so yes for long uh, artifacts and technologies have had political and ethical impacts and there's been a lot of research and uh, re uh, writing upon all of this and one of the anthologies that are um, of some sort of importance or great relevance for you is this uh, edition by peter paul uh, peter uh, fermas and peter cruz and andrew light and stephen a moore back from 2008 philosophy and design from engineering to to architecture that points at the fact that there, there is a moral significance in technologies themselves and uh, the role of technology and the intentionality that is layered in technological artifacts can't be reduced to the intentions uh, behind their design, you designers and their actual users by by users, whomever they may be. So it's been up and running for at least 10, 15 years. This fact that technologies uh, have uh, a shaping force when it comes to, to ethics, uh, morals and politics. I don't know if you noticed that uh, in a former slide, I said, okay, morals and uh, and ethics. And the thing is, is, is there a difference in between morals and uh, ethics? Some philosophers would claim that there is not, not ethics is just the Greek uh, concept for dealing with uh, values and how we address these values in a societal uh, context and morals is just the latin translation of uh, of ethics i do not agree with that uh, interpretation of uh, of the two concepts i think there is a a difference in how we use them uh, apply them today because as i see it morality and morals is uh, temporal are temporal uh, they are malleable they are contextual and they are tied to the actual situations 
where we try to act morally correct. Whereas ethics and the principles uh, attached to ethics, they are considered as eternal, they are considered as principle, and to some extent also general and uh, universal, which means these principles count uh, everywhere and uh, every time that we apply them out there in the, in the real world. Continuing on, on this uh, path, uh, we can talk a bit about ethical principle in relation to, to engineering design and architectural practice, setting up what others have coined as value sensitive design, where you work with values and you work with norms and you work with technical requirements than the moment that you address a specific problem out there. And one could say that the, the principles or the concepts on the left-hand side of this slide are exactly uh, universal, general. Uh, we can address a lot of them back to Aristoteles, back to Immanuel Kant in, in the late 18th uh, century about autonomy, about beneficence, about non-maleficence and, uh, and justice and which norms we can attach to these uh, concepts. I hope you can see these norms as well. If not, uh, I can briefly talk about them. So beneficence is about doing what is best for, in this case, uh, the patient or could be the citizen or the user or the inhabitant or whomever they, that may be. The non-maleficence is, uh, first of all, do not harm and think about that, uh, for instance, doctors are fallible, but we are equally capable of harming uh, as well as helping our patients. So this should be con considered the moment that we, that we act. And how finally do we attach uh, technical aims to these uh, concepts and to these norms that the moment that we actually do something. And this overall slide I shall return to in detail when, when moving forward. It's not easy, <laughs> all of this. And there are many, many perspectives on how to address things. Now in the north western part of uh, Europe, uh, which we are right now, and I don't know if you out there among the audiences uh, all uh, relate to and are part of uh, this part of uh, the world, we have welfare states, hmm? uh, wherein we herald the, the concept of uh, equality which means in, in a democratic uh, society, all should be treated equally, which means that independent of the means that you already have, you receive the same amount of attention. Might that be economic, might that be for what concerns uh, the, uh, the service of, uh, of care, of housing or, or whatever. So equality is at stake. If in Denmark, for instance, uh, we all have the right to receive uh, funding for our kids independent uh, of uh, our income, yearly income. We all have the right to, to pensions independent of our income. So equality is all over the place. But is equality just? Uh, no. <laughs> is it? with an English uh, term, uh, a representation of uh, equity? No. And I think this figure clearly shows that there are some issues the moment that we take this, uh, rather we would say, okay, concept of equality into, into the design world and design our services uh, meant for the, for the public with an outset of equality. Perhaps we should rather address uh, 
values and norms that uh, reflect equity and re reflect uh, justice. And I hope that you in your uh, daily practices and in in the future to come will address these issues also being part of this uh, welfare state that can be critiqued with an outset in this uh, particular slide where technology again plays a very significant and important role. <laughs> so just briefly, these were some initial thoughts about uh, morals and, and ethics where ethical principles is about uh, the universal and the general, whereas morals is about what happens in our everyday life practices. And my theoretical background is, is pretty much about how we deal with uh, reality in our, through and with our everyday practices, which are mediated and uh, translated, transformed, enhanced whatsoever by by technology so i've got uh, this background so to say first and foremost it's it's phenomenological i'm highly inspired by uh, by martin heidegger and uh, the french philosopher maurice merleau ponty heidegger being german as most of you uh, probably maybe uh, know already a rather intriguing and problematic figure, I admit. Return to that. Um, elaborations upon uh, phenomenology that uh, was developed in the 20th century by these uh, architects and others, where a focus was actually specifically addressed towards the, the role and the importance of how technology shape, uh, shape world and uh, shape selves, our selves, which is uh, represented in in the position of uh, post-phenomenology, which was uh, originally coined by the, again, American philosopher Don Eide back in the 1990s and furthered by the Dutch philosopher, whom I'm pretty much inspired by, Peter Paul Verbeek, and I'll return to him as well. I mentioned Andrew Feenberg already and his uh, take on things, which is inspired by critical theory. Another position in what is, has been coined as uh, continental uh, philosophy in opposition to analytical uh, philosophy and continental philosophy addresses mainly German and French uh, philosophy in the 20th uh, century. And they are all represented here to some extent specifically within post-actor network theory and i shan't dig further into all of these various positions that i deal with in my everyday uh, work as a philosopher of um, technology that i have gradually become without uh, having the specific education of uh, being a philosopher so I construct this patchwork and I actually encourage everybody to construct patchwork uh, in order to, to gain this, these uh, hybrid imaginaries that uh, addresses actual problems and not just stick to one uh, way of looking at reality through one specific uh, theory because as you know, um, Theories are uh, lamp lights, you know, with a fairly, a fairly short range. And in order to broaden the range and in order to actually see uh, the problem from as many uh, perspectives as possible, I think it is actually needed to, to patchwork. Even though in patchworking, the patches to some extent have uh, to, to fit or to, to be complementary, so to say. And the complementary issues in in my way of, uh, of patchworking is that phenomenology and post-phenomenology is looking at the, uh, at the subject, at the individual, at the citizen, at the patient, at the user, whereas critical theory and uh, post-ANT ap approaches 
uh, addressing things on a more systemic, organizational and institutional, and sometimes also political, political uh, level. So, to my opinion, we are uh, always in need of patchworking because of the complexity and the diversity of the problems that we are standing in front of. So, here he, he is one of my gurus. I move a bit faster now. I see time is running and there are still some slides to go. So, just to sketch up uh, the background here is uh, on the right hand side uh, a photograph of uh, Martin Heidegger and he has inspired me quite a lot in in relation to setting up this and dealing with this concept of uh, of scaffolding which can meet a lot of things uh, the German word for it that he uses the castell can be grid frame rack shelf to mount to in frame to scaffold and normally translated into English, it's it's actually always, almost only addressed as a sort of inframing where uh, humans and individuals are inframed by te technology and set up as a sort of standing reserve for exploitation. That's the very negative reading of uh, Heidegger, but it's also the most common reading of uh, Heidegger. I am aware that this reading is part of the game, but also see the other side of, of the coin and of the technological Janus uh, phase, that technology can also be the saving part of it all and how to address the saving part within uh, the concept of Gestell is actually seeing it as a sort of uh, scaffold uh, building. There are some central phenomenological uh, statements as well that should be addressed the moment that we deal with uh, technology and also specific, uh, specifically digital uh, technologies. Now, I know that you've been working with during this week, at least those of you that uh, chose to work at, at the, in the late afternoon workshops with with uh, Rhino and uh, Grasshopper and Campara 3D and parametric uh, design and stuff like that. And all of these we actually consider sort of phenomenologically speaking, as some sort of uh, tool just doing uh, their job in order for you to come up with some sort of design result. But phenomenologically speaking and specifically in a post phenomenological perspective we should address address the toolness of, of this tool what is it the tool mediates the moment that you use it in your practices because um, it it uh, represents it it it's the moment that it works at the best it, it shows its rationale, something specific mediated by technology will be the final result that transcends your original intentions the moment that you uh, applied the tool. So it's very uh, important that you critically reflect upon this toolness of the tool. And the negative reading of Heidegger that I talked about uh, just before is that numbers and uh, calculations and models that are based on numbers and cal calculations will be one dimensional to using to use one of his uh, students words Herbert Marcuse and will be restraining in framing and set up uh, reality for uh, exploitation and humans as part of that and we should be aware of this uh, of this danger the moment that we apply these tools but as i was saying other potentials uh, and possibilities are there to be considered as well the moment that we address the danger of applying 
uh, technologies uh, based on digits and and uh, numbers and as i see it and this is my quote these are my quotes uh, it's important to to consider how things oscillate in between these poles of dangers and and of hope that uh, that technology mediates and it is there in this oscillation in between danger and hope that we experiment we construct we shape and we create and we do this in co-creational co-constitutional co-production co-whatever practices uh, constantly as uh, engineers and designers and uh, and architects we are so to say we are destined as i see it so there's a sort of determinism at hand by and with technology we have to get ever closer to technology in order to solve the problems of uh, of emergence that we are facing today and these are many mm, climate uh, inequity poverty uh, pandemics uh, whatever we have out there and in here as well uh, to deal with <clears throat> And in order to get closer to these problems and solve them, uh, we have to get closer to uh, technology, but constantly addressing the fact that that danger and exactly hope is is that uh, is that stake. Scaffolding that I'm talking about right now um, is, as I read it, is a, it's a communal, collaborate, and actually also a very daring enterprise. And here I'm actually looking at the physical world as the photograph uh, background uh, shows you at all uh, and scaffolding out there in the physical world when we build scaffolds we do that in order to to build actually to preserve to innovate or what for whatever reason we raise scaffolds and these um, means of the scaffold out in the physical world could perhaps even be taken in to how we scaffold things with technology also in the digital space because here we are actually perhaps not so much any longer but still stepping out into the uncertain and to into the unknown asking the questions where are the others in digital space can i trust the others and all of that that social media as well addresses and we are addressed by social media constantly about the role of others and how to trust uh, others might they be digital or analogous in this in this game and of course i think that these questions raised should not be answered exclusively i should have written by computational engineers or by scientific experts in algorithms for that matter they are part of the game they are main players also in the game but should be supplemented by uh, other uh, types of experts that take in these th things into into consideration so yes when we scaffold there's danger uh, dangerous at hand unintentional confusion and misunderstandings is might be the case and i've got this representation on the left hand side again with the building of uh, the tower of uh, of babel uh, back in millenniums of, of years the if it even was built we don't know but according to the old testament it led to a lot of confusion and misunderstandings and uh, and failure in the in the very end this uh, this common enterprise so yes we might end in in dead ends and and be as heidegger told, told us in his famous essay from 1951 on, on a uh, path in the forest and losing losing our our direction and uh, and go in that strive towards solution of, uh, of of problems. Continuing on on this uh, this path, what do we do? How do we address uh, the tools, and how do we address 
that reality that constitutes the moment that we apply these tools, creating a digital representation that represents something, buildings, uh, a square in the city, or a physical home, or or what, uh, whatever. How do we create the sense of place? How do we create the sense of home? The moment that we create stuff with uh, with digits. Uh, how do we uh, make space and uh, and room for that concept of of feeling at home where we actually feel safe and are able to respect and and love uh, others there well uh, we are handling new tools or fairly new tools the moment that we build and construct in digital space but uh, we should actually consider the background upon which we are constructing as something known it is known we do construct things that we can relate to as we meet the realities that you build up uh, through uh, digital uh, programs and it is the meeting in between the known and the unknown, uh, in between uh, the physical body and the virtual digital body that we constantly should uh, address the moment that we make oscillations and move in these oscillations in between, in between uh, worlds and realities. And I've used the, the score sheet here from the Italian uh, composer Silvano Busotti and his five piano pieces for David David Tudor in 1960 to to address this uh, this issue. And this music was actually play, played by David uh, Tudor, even though it seems impossible for us even today to grasp. So the scaffold and scaffolding should be considered a thing. It's, it's a sort of gathering of humans and technologies that constantly together uh, meet in, in enterprises and endeavors where uh, we are meant to address the caring, the nurturing, the cherishing, the conservation, the innovation, the curation, and sort of construct a sense of commonness the moment that we, that we apply these tools and do stuff and things uh, together. I just added the last phrase here uh, this morning as I as I got up uh, because so while well, I'm sitting here in front of engineers and and engineers of construction and and art architects, and I said mm, perhaps one way that this, this would make sense is to point at one foremost quality of, uh, of scaffolding. And I think that's transparency for that matter, that scaffolds are transparent. So they are, so to say, they are letting us see all the processes, uh, all the elements that the scaffold contains and that is, it is built out of and what is scaffolded can be seen through the scaffold. So I think that one very important uh, concept to be dealt with uh, on a value level in relation to scaffolding is, is to keep uh, transparency, both on a literal level, but also on a phenomenological one and in, transla in, tra and in translating into phenomenology, in relation to the concept, it, com it becomes about uh, that the way that you deal with materials are honest, so to say. There's a certain kind of uh, honesty at stake when you talk about uh, transparency. Looking briefly uh, here again, how do how have we recently been dealing with? Um, morals and, and ethics in relation to digitalization and, and digits. I think this um, publication from 2015 is uh, fairly important to address. It's an anthology edited by the Italian, but based in Oxford, uh, 
philosopher Luciano Floridi, who yeah, edited the online manifesto Being Human in a Hyperconnected Era. And it is actually a publication as a result of a EU project that had this uh, aim of addressing the problem of how do we deal with, uh, with digital realities in a meaningful and just way in a European context, meeting the way that, for instance, uh, um, American market driven ways of uh, seeing digital world or uh, one would uh, call it uh, state capitals, Chinese, Chinese way of uh, dealing with this uh, digital reality. So Luciano Floridi's uh, work here is an attempt to end, uh, to, to point at this European path in between an American and a Chinese way of dealing with digital realities. And you can read here on the left hand side what the the aims and uh, the main points of uh, of the actual manifesto so returning to to the dangers and hazards that uh, are possible the moment that we meet and address numbers um, i should briefly quote heidegger actually when he says that when modern physics exerts itself to establish the world's formula what occurs thereby is the being of entities has resolved itself into a method of the totally calculable so this will according to heidegger um, be our destiny the moment that we let numbers loose and act upon their own and we don't have some sort of control or steering over how we construct, co-construct, co-constitute and co-design things together with uh, digits and, and numbers. And it should be uh, the result of uh, a critical thinking and, and reflection. We scaffold in order for all of this to happen. It has to be benign and, and caring. We should address these elements the moment that we construct uh, the benign and, and caring issues that are at stake because our physical bodies, they sit here, we sit there, they are vulnerable, they are fragile, fragile, they are volatile, they are unstable, but at the same time they are pretty hard and solid and mirror as such reality. The digital world is flat, two-dimensional, fixed, measurable and calculable calculable and you see how I sort of address the negative elements as uh, Heidegger was pointing at but uh, how can we, we met, uh, let these ends meet in the very end and that's uh, the most important question that we actually should address the moment that we set up these uh, digital worlds with an outset of, of the scaffolding. So digital scaffolds are co-constructions that and co-creation co-creations that embraces digital others and analogous others so when we set up representations beautiful representations in rhino or grasshoppers or in parametric design we should allow for interaction in these uh, creation in between digital uh, selves that move there or and have the move to have the possibility and the poten potentials of moving there and at the same time drag in uh, the analogous and physical body uh, to interact with these digital others because this meeting in between the digital and the analogous uh, is uh, of high potential force as i as i read it in this non-dystopian and non-positive non-positive <laughs> non-determinist way of uh, looking at this meeting in between the physical and and the virtual so the battlefield as i see it right now and now i'll speed up even more is that uh, we got two paradigms here 
now as I see it. We got the Silicon Valley paradigm that has been reigning for the past 10, 20 years, which is about disrupt or die. That should, according to what I've been talking about and not just me, be replaced by a new paradigm, which is about, hey, care or die. Because if we do not care on a temporal basis, also considering our past and what we did in the past and what we do in the present in order to act appropriately in the future, it's about caring in order not to meet extinction in the very end. <clears throat> Yes. Okay. Inspired by Peter Paul Fabek is what I'm going to finish uh, my talk about and introduce some models. Uh, Peter Paul Fabek, Fabek talks about how we are constantly together with uh, technology. There's a triad of elements in, in the construct, which is humans, uh, world, and technology in the middle. We act, have practices in in the world and all of this is mediated by technology we perceive and experience reality and all of, all of this is also conceived and by uh, technology and i think this figure uh, is okay but it's it's really not good enough uh, this is better as i see it because here it actually shows the central role that technology has the moment that we act and perceive and conceive and practice and whatsoever in the world, in this lemniscate of human technology world relations where everything is constantly moving and acting in a reality where technology is in the middle, middle and mediates our being in that very, very world. We got some short chains at uh, at stake in a post phenomenological reading of of, uh, of things where it's about an analyzing how humans and technologies are together how you interact with your programs the moment that you design in rhino or whatever and how this so to say manifests itself comes out in a world and you can then go back into the loop and produce new technologies and take up uh, all of this in iterative processes that the lemnis gate that i showed before was an example of and these short chains can consist of a human actor a technology and a reality or a human actor technology and an other human in this figure and i think the big figure here which is it actually is this is one where the human actor is part of it, uh, but we actually got two boxes with uh, technology part of it. Technology is constantly addressing, as I read it, values. Values are always at stake independently what type of technology we are talking about. There are some values at stake and we should consider these potential uh, or the potentiality of uh, of value, how uh, value can increase, decrease, and change stuff, as uh, as it is um, affected in a world and in a uh, reality. I talked about this Janus phase of uh, of reality, so I shall not dwell at that. As I see it, scaffold then is. Uh, a common enterprise where these short chains are connected and intersected in these common enterprises. And that's, of course, my phenomenological and post phenomenological take on stuff. Because if I had an overly systemic uh, perspective on things, I would not break down things in order to see the short chains as I uh, do with the overall phenomenological outset that I do have. So if you follow me, it's about breaking down these uh, huge systemic uh, and endeavors in order to see the short, the short chains and how they are connected and intersected. 
and you should consider as well the moment that you design stuff how the short chains how the interaction in between the technologies the housings or the plannings that that you do how they affect the individual and how these um, things in the end manifest through your uh, designs and through the technologies that you have created finally some small models that i've created recently about uh, tinkering with all of all of this a set of a triangle here in order to show how technology human configurations could be addressed from on an overall level from different angles trying to break up these technology human configurations in respectively science and nature and in a uh, societal point where we got experts on under science we got artifacts and things that are part of world and nature and in the society we got different types of actors at, at stake citizens users stakeholders politicians um, professionals whoever uh, may be there as elements the moment that you deconstruct um, the picture of um, of that reality or that problems uh, that you're actually addressing and how we on an overall still with a focus on the technical can break down the technology human configuration from respectively a political public uh, perspective a design perspective and what does that mean what types of designs are we talking about when things have to be considered from uh, appropriately and techno science what should be installed the moment that we think the relationship in between science and nature mediated by uh, technology then it becomes about responsibility is about addressing the relationship in between values and facts and facts and norms for that matter and uh, empirical ethics as well so this is one way of just framing on an in an overall way the next figure which is very complex and i shall not go through it but it's a it's so i see it as a sort of speculative model for tinkering it came out uh, in december last year it was fairly new this one is part of an article that dealt with um, e-health which i'm also still addressing so looking into okay these health information informatic informatic uh, technologies how can i we uh, sort of say deconstruct this and try to find out what is at stake and how can we address these um, elements that are part of uh, the the dance of agency so to say where people healthcare professionals decision makers and designers and the interests and logics that they carry can be part of um, an analytical framework for looking at rather complex elements uh, in this in this game so i call for techno activism and this is my last slide uh, in the very beginning and i set up back in 2015 in some writings that i did back then uh, what i've coined at, at as the seven e's of techno activism or of an action research approach where values and morals and ethics are so to say part of of the game where i see okay first of all you have to be engaged hmm, in what you're doing and i think that's a primary requirement for all types of of uh, practices and and knowledge production specifically within academia that you are engaged if not nothing will happen and you will get good interesting results is about physically involved in that reality that you're part of in order to to gain insight to what the other uh, is feeling and meaning and sensing and perceiving and conceiving uh, both the analogous other and the digital other so you have to meet reality with some sort of empathy and you do that in order to enact so 
and enact here means that you do stuff in order to change things for the better on all levels, <clears throat> individually, societally, on an institutional, organizational level. So I pointed these out with red in order to show you that this is these are actions that we actually perform the moment that we do something in our laboratories, in our uh, wherever we're sitting. And we do it in order to enhance things, to become faster and stronger and whatever. Uh, we do that in order to empower people independently if there are professionals. I also do that in order to empower myself in my practices, being a designer, but also with the aim of empower the actual uh, user of, um, or the receiver of, of my designs. And uh, finally, also in order to emancipate myself in my practices and emancipate uh, the people that are going to be affected by the, the actual design. So there's both uh, action and there's our aims at, uh, at the actions that, so to say, reflect uh, technological potentialities that are always there that the moment that we that we design. Yes, and here are some recent references that deals with what I've been telling you about uh, today, both within philosophy of technology and also some of it is also actually part of an architectural paradigm. Yeah, so I see it's just one minute to 10. So <laughs> thank you for your patient attention. Here's the scaffold, a beautiful one embracing uh, nature and there's even some humans in it yeah. Yeah. thank you very much uh, Lars uh, th this was uh, so so inspiring and so kind of fantastic uh